spent eight years in an STS department. That's how I know my 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 Zach, who was my co-pilot then and has continues to be now. Um, I'm working at the moment in a media studies department. Um, and I guess a very general way to characterize my work is to say that it seeks clues to broader uh, social, economic, uh, existential predicaments by paying close empirical and ethnographic attention um, to the interplay of use and design of interactive technology. Um, so the way that I, you can go to the next slide, and I just um, wanted to um, flag. Uh, so yeah, if you go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to sort of say how I got into the current project. Um, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, and Jaume, I think that you can, you have to move the from a slide. <laughs> this isn't working very well today, <laughs> um, but I'll just talk. It's Maybe he'll come. Um, so in my first book, um, what I was looking at was how technology is harnessed, um, not, and I was looking particularly at um, slot machine gambling. Um, and I was looking not just at the machines themselves and their mathematics, but also the audio visuals, the, the, the architecture, the atmosphere of the casino, even the seats, all of these different levels of technology and how work was being done to reduce uh, gamblers' critical thinking capacities and suspend them in this kind of machine zone um, where their attention was so focused that they become inattentive to the passage of time and money um, and they get caught in this gamified loop of repetition. Um, and uh, let me just ask, are we gonna be able to move through the slides? Because if we're not, um, I, I need to know that. Oh. Hello. <laughs> ah, sorry. I had the microphone silenced. Um, I can't see anything right now. Yes, because I, I need to... Now, can you see the slides? Yeah. Is it moving? So I guess we're on the second slide, maybe now. Yeah. Yes. No. Which yeah, slide is on? Uh, we're on slide two, but I do. Uh, Can you see slide two now? No. Sí, ya me pasa la segona, por favor. Estica la segona. Estica. I'm 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 going through the slides, but they're not apparently. Yeah, now we can see it. No. Um, now? Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to try to just skip some of my talk because we, we've lost um, so much time here. Um, but what I, the, you can go to the third slide. The basic point I wanted to make was that in my first, um, so, so if you could go to the third, yeah. So in my, um, in my like this? first. Like no, this? Like this. That, that's number four. Yes, 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 Is but it, now it's, it's, it's rolling. Are you, are you sure you guys want to do this today? Because we've lost so much time and I've seen people logging off and um, we're so far behind now. It, it seems like the technology is just giving us too many issues. Uh, I think that we are fine now in the sense that I think that it's, uh, it's, it's going. If you feel <laughs> okay. comfortable with going on, we can just yeah. make a last try. Okay, I'm just going to try to cut some some things. So um, the, the the point of contrast with my first work was that these were technologies of all sorts of different registers, sort of high tech digital technologies plus um, you know very analog ergonomic kind of technologies, um, and they were all being harnessed to remove people from their um, choice making from their uh, awareness of time and space, from being a responsible self in time. Um, the project, the, the kind of um, technologies that you see on the screen now are a very different set of technologies. And this is why I chose this as my next project, 
um, because I was interested in a contrast with this, this set of technologies, um, so-called self-tracking technologies, which are all geared to counteract or protect against the kind of um, you know, machine zone or attention absorption um, in, in, um, that we see in websites and Facebook and slot machines as in my first book. So in the first wave of self-tracking technology, it was designed not to keep us you know, zoned out and unself-attentive, but precisely to keep us attentive to various mundane um, yet consequential aspects of our daily existence. So keep our attention and awareness and consciousness on our eating habits, our physical movement, the way we spend our time, our money, our stress levels. Um, you'll recall that the title of this talk is From Compass to Sentinel. Um, and this early logic of the self-tracking technology um, really the, is the logic of a compass to sort of place you in time and make you aware of yourself. So what I want to do in the uh, remaining slides is trace um, the shift I've detected in the recent history of this technology from, from this compass logic to a kind of sentinel logic, which is a trajectory toward uh, increasing automation. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, uh, which shows the quantified self, thank you. Um, so in the early days of self-tracking technology, it was heavily associated with this group, the quantified self, which seeks, as you see here in the tagline, self-knowledge through numbers. And this started in the San Francisco Bay Area when these um, groups of savvy individuals would gather and reflect on what they might learn from these um, data gathering devices and analytic software um, about the sort of the mundane mysteries of of life, their everyday life, um, what uh, you know drug side effects, how their sleep may be affected, their relationship dynamics or their productivity at work. Um, and so forth. So they follow this quest for self-knowledge for numbers. If we could go to the next slide, um, you see that that um, focus on self-knowledge is emphasized in these early headlines around the quantified self group. Um, and I'll, I'll read you a quote from a longtime self-tracker uh, who spoke with me. He said, it's about introspection, reflection, seeing patterns and arriving at realizations about who you are and how you might change. The next slide captures this also. This was a um, 2.5 years of my weight that was um, captured by um, a tracker, as you see here. She told me um, I gained a lot of insights from this heat map. So there was a very sort of do it yourself, take charge of your data, design your own tracking system um, ethos in these rooms of quantified self where I started my research for this project. Um, but you know, soon after I started attending the meetings in around 2011, this new type of participant would show up in the room. Um, and this kind of participant would sit in the back and they were not there to share their own data. They were there to take notes. Um, and they were interested in how to monetize this formula, how to develop smartphone applications and devices for self-tracking and take that formula to market. So this was a critical point in my research where I realized it could not be a project only about quantified self, but that I should follow this, um, or the, this sort of formula for self-quantification and self-tracking, follow it to market. So for part of my research, and um, the next slide, um, I followed it into, and this is sort of early shots, you can go to the next slide too, the aisles of Best Buy, um, you know, literal and virtual aisles. I would go to actual stores, these large big box stores in the US, um, and also online to places like Amazon. This is a screenshot from 2014 which I find interesting. I don't expect you can read it on your screen, but this is um, right when they set up this wearable technology marketplace on Amazon. And they gave a sort of pedagogical gloss to prompt consumers on how you might, you know, lo looking for this, um, curious about knowing, you know, more about your health and your steps. So they were kind of priming the consumer market um, for how they could use this technology. 
Um, another place where I went, and this is in the next slide, would be the Consumer Electronics Show. And this is actually um, how I ended up back in Las Vegas for this second object. Um, in the same uh, trade convention halls that I had spent so much time in when I was researching the design of these very predatory slot machine technologies. Um, so next slide. Um, here is a review of the Consumer Electronics Show from 2013. Again, this is early years. And um, quantified self really was the model here. You can see that in the title of this article for what self-tracking should look like, how it should function, how it should operate. It was about, there's a line right in the middle here, consciously keeping track of healthy or unhealthy choices. So consciously keeping track. Um, if we could see the next slide. Um, this is just a quote from someone at the meeting um, during a panel who describes in greater detail how these were envisioned in the early days, that you could, through the, using these kind of Fitbits, et cetera, you could build a picture of what you're doing. You can see and understand the choices that you're making, um, see how your choices are impacting you how the gauges are moving as you make choices. So just to lift out of this for a moment, the, the subject that is being figured here is a rational, self-aware choice maker. And the relation, so, so this is certainly, you could say, with relation to the technology and capitalist theme of this series, um, this is absolutely a capitalist subject of a certain sort. This is homo economicus. This is the consumer sovereign. Um, of neoliberal economics, right? This is a self-aware choice maker um, who doesn't want to just sort of act automatically and at the whim of others. Um, if you could do, show the next slide, um, here we see this, um, this subject figured in these three ads. It happens to be women, but there's ads out there with men as well for the Fitbit. And uh, the, the, these subjects are responsibly using their compass. And you can see the compass um, evoked not only in the way that they're sort of consulting this device while they're out and about exercising in a parking lot, walking down the street, but also because the technology itself is designed like a compass in the actual images. So this is a, a compass for modern living that helps consumers navigate this um, otherwise, perhaps confounding, sometimes toxic landscape of choice making. And as you see in the top right slide, the point is to um, recognize that very small daily decisions, these small consumer acts, if you will, um, such as how many steps to take, how many bites to eat, how many minutes you know, of sleep, add up to big results. So it's trying to take these small little bits and bites of life, um, very mundane things, and uh, make them consequential and put you in touch with them. Um, so next slide. Um, so this began to shift. I'm, I'm giving the sort of arc here of this shift in logic away from the compass. Um, by the 2015 meeting, um, the growing consensus was that average people, you and I, citizens, consumers, are overwhelmed or discouraged, actually, by knowing too much about ourselves, by seeing our numbers, and that the work of design should be to turn away from full information toward meaningful insight. So here you see an ad for a Samsung watch, which says, um, this device knows me better than I know myself, and helps me be a better human. So this is still a subject who is striving to be a responsible choice maker, but is not pretending that she can do that all on her own by digesting all of her numbers and acting on them. So the kinds of things that you started to see would be uh, weighing scales that do not show you numbers. So it's a, it's a sort of de-quantification, you could say. Um, they instead will just vibrate on your feet if you're on track with your, your sort of weight goals. They won't overwhelm you with um, the, the tiny metrics of your weight. So as we'll see in the remainder of my talk, um, this logic shifts 
even further away from knowledge altogether, right? In this ad here, it's still about knowing, right? The device is the one that, that becomes the sort of epistemological agent. It knows you better than it knows yourself. But really, knowledge falls away, and it becomes more about just guidance, keeping on track. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so here is an early version of, of this, this trend toward the kind of guidance without knowledge. Um, so instead of increasing awareness, it, it gives you these little haptic nudges. Um, one of the first one was an, called an idle alert. So it was a wristband. And if you had been inactive for more than 15 minutes, it would vibrate. And you could keep, you know, it didn't interrupt you. It was frictionless in that sense. You didn't need to pay attention to it, reflect on it in any way. You just responded with your body by maybe stretching, getting up. Um, the one on the right is a posture correcting device um, where, you know, as you're typing or walking, it will buzz on your back and sort of alert you to straighten your shoulders, but doesn't interrupt you, does not request your cognition as such. Another example is in the next slide where we see the spire. So this is a small stone-like device that helps to you to regulate your breath um, and by extension your stress levels. So it will alert you as in this image here, um, you're in a tense streak, time for a breath. Um, it will alert you on your phone, but you don't need to have your phone, right? It will also alert you by vibrating subtly on your, on your body. Um, so you know like to slow your breath. Um, I think, uh, and the next slide is just another example of these kind of devices that will sit. Um, and you know, the, a lot of these posture devices and the idle alert are really geared toward office workers or those of us who are, who are involved in some kind of knowledge work that requires us to be um, at computers. Um, so in the next slide, I'm not sure that there's any video there anymore. I was going to show you a um, an early Fitbit video. So I'll just um, sort of, um, or actually let's go to the next, yeah, the next slide. So some of you may even have Apple watches. I'm not sure that they do this anymore, but at one point they had these haptic alerts that I believe they branded as tap taptic because it would tap you on your wrist so that you can um, something like, select a walking destination on a map and you don't need to actually have the map in front of you or a compass you know or anything to consult and reflect upon instead you just have your conversation or you listen to music you dame you walk um, with your head up and there are certain taps um, for turning left or turning right um, that will kind of guide you so this captures that kind of the, the watch is looking out for you. The watch is a kind of sentinel that will guide you. Um, so the last um, haptic example I want to look at, if you go to the next slide, um, is called the happy fork. So hap, happy for happy, I guess, and also haptic. So this is a fork. It's a smart utensil that um, it's about the pace of eating. So it monitors your mouth and your hand and sort of closes the loop whenever the fork, the metal fork tines enter your mouth. And what it's trying to do is um, measure the amount of time between each bite. So if you see the next slide, uh, the way that it works is it will vibrate in your mouth, like the metal will vibrate on your teeth if you take a bite too quickly, less than 10 seconds, and you will if, if you were consulting your phone, you would see this kind of countdown, oops, too fast, and it would vibrate. Um, and he here's um, some product literature quote uh, words for you. Um, you are advised to take 10 to 20 chews. If you trigger the happy fork alarm by eating too fast, don't panic. Set the fork down at the side of the plate and wait until the light turns green, signaling that it is safe to take another bite. So, you know, this, this mundane act of eating is turned into a question of panic um, and safety. In the next slide, um, 
we see um, Stephen Colbert, who made a, um, a sort of comedy remark, what is the point of consumer technology that keeps you from consuming? Frankly, it's un-American. Um, but it seems to me un-American in another sense as well. If you consider this long tradition of self-help um, in the US that really upholds the, the cultivation of inner restraint and self-control and rejects reliance on external forces, whether that might is that those forces are other people or technologies. So here we have a technology that kind of does it for you, right? Um, if you could slip two slides, skip two slides. So to, yeah, to the next one. Mm -hmm. So here we have this question that's that's um, uh, on top of the most frequently asked questions of Happy Fork, and it says. You know, if I want to eat more slowly, can't I do it by myself? You know, why not cultivate and learn to behave better with the pace of your eating? And I think the response that this technology gives really demonstrates um, the degree to which um, uh, it has become kind of okay to let technology guide you. It, it, basically says, you know, if you're if you're sitting with your friends or if you're watching TV or having a conversation, you really can't be expected um, to focus, it says, on counting the bites or watching the time. Um, so the fork basically says, we, we will leave your ears, your eyes free to continue attending to whatever compelling stimuli might absorb you. And we will just nudge you in this haptic way. It, we will pay attention for you. We will be the sentinel. And interestingly, there's, you know, you could imagine that someone would use the fork as a way to train themselves, right? As a kind of biofeedback and then put the fork away and go out into the world with a better eating pace. But nowhere in the literature is the idea that you would eat without the fork just as these other technologies we've been we've been looking at um, it's not about cultivating better habits it's really just about um, letting these devices play out their sentinel logic of watching out for you knowing for you and guiding you um, so next slide um, again just this point that instead of this sort of prior generation of biofeedback or training, right? Um, raising awareness of your own physiological signals um, so that you can learn to self-adjust. This is really a different model of attunement. The, po the point is to just kind of snap you through these little nudges to momentary attention. And I, I call this actuated attention. It's, you know, actuators are, are working to sort of vibrate. And then release you back quite quickly into this unnoticing, unvigilant state. And so this is a different kind of consumer that was figured in the compass logic that we started out with, um, as you saw in the early um, in the in the early slides. So this this is a subject that is not assumed to have the attentional space to self attend um, to even be a rational tracker. Um, or choice maker. So it's a very interesting logic that's unfolding, right? Um, that in many ways both shows the underbelly of this self responsible choice making subject that we talk about so much in relationship to contemporary capitalism. Um, it, it sort of merges in with that other subject of corporate capitalism, which is the unaware, consuming, absorbed subject um, who is not critical or rational, right? So this technology is sort of allowing you to be both at once. It's allowing you um, to continue consuming or watching, being distracted, watch TV while you have dinner, but you can also win at the imperative for um, self-responsible management that is also part of, of contemporary capitalist imperatives, right? So here's a quote that really captures this longing that I think consumers have to both track and be responsible in their choices, but really don't want to do it. So she says, um, I don't want to track. I want it to be done for me. This is a health technology designer and also a self-tracker. Uh, she says, insert a chip in my mouth 
and have it record the calories for me. So the, these Sentinel devices step in and perform this prosthetic, um, this prosthetic function, and they allow us to basically um, continue with unfettered absorption and consumption, yet also be responsible by wearing these devices. Um, so if you give me the next slide, um, I thought this was an interesting slide um, to really show how the self, the, the self-aware subject really is falling out of the equation in, in much of this um, technology. This is a um, device made by Think, uh, where you can put this thing on your head. Um, there's now a new version that's a patch behind your ear. And you choose whether you want calm or whether you want energize. Um, and then you just let it do its work. Um, and this is formulated by the designers in direct contrast to Fitbit. And the contrast is people don't want to spend time and energy changing themselves. This, you just put it on and it will change your brain waves. It will, it, it's been approved by the US, Zach will be interested to know, by the FDA. Um, it's equivalent to having a couple of cups of coffee in the energize mode or taking a half a Valium in the calm mode. Um, and the self is really not in the loop at all, so to speak. Um, you're not doing anything. It's not even reading you or tracking you. It is just putting you in this, um, it's guiding you to this better state. Um, but it sits you know, alongside these other self-tracking technologies, kind of showing where we've come to. Um, another device, and it's the last one I'll show you in the next slide, that also um, maybe almost too nicely captures this um, turn to automation is called this, the, the, the mother, the sense mother. Um, the sense mother gives you whatever you need whenever you want. So if at first it was about know thyself, as you see in the next slide, um, it is now up on the red ad on the top. It is now about an all-knowing mother who knows everything. Um, so this has gone even beyond that watch that knows you better than yourself. The mother um, keeps track for you using these little motion cookies that you will put um, on your water faucet or your fridge or your father's pillbox. And it basically helps you to manage and track all these things you're responsible for. Um, by reminding you when it's time to have a drink or, you know, dad's pillbox hasn't been opened um, and sort of calls you to attention as needed when you need to attend. And tellingly, the advertisements emphasize this will blend into your life and adapt to your behavior without requiring any effort, training, or care from you. So I like to think of this as a kind that, that self-care and self-tracking of the sort of responsible choice-making subject is replaced with a kind of algorithmic care um, where friction is minimized and the algorithm um, sort of does it for you. So um, I, I, I've sped through these and to, if you give me the, the, last, um, the last slide, uh, which is the final slide, um, nope, up, up, uh, my last slide is not the last slide in here. If you could go up to the okay. picture of the, uh, that's it, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry. So what we, what we see here um, is, a, is a turn toward, um, you know, increasing automation. That's the, that's the trajectory that I'm tracking um, in technologies that are designed to help people manage everyday life choices and behavior. So it's true that to self-track, right, to even buy this technology, it's not the same as being a, a, you know, a slot machine addict or someone who's immersed in a, in a video game. Um, you, you are a subject who heavily values your choices and your behavior and who understands the need to be responsible. So there's certainly a buy-in to this ethos of personal responsibility, to this logic of care. But the point I want to make is that self-tracking and the way that the technology has evolved um, really expresses a desire to not be in charge, a desire to delegate care. Um, and this technology that I've glossed uh, presents itself as a solution um, to that desire. 
So I think I will end there and ask if there's any questions or time for questions. <laughs> Thank, thanks, uh, thank you very much, Natasha, for this uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I think that there is time. Um, we have uh, half an hour, 35 minutes for uh, for questions. There's uh, Zach, the first question. Thank you. Uh, really interesting talk, Natasha. It's fun to follow your work and see it evolving. Um, I just wanted to sort of co comment, which I hope will be, you can turn into a question and to, with an answer. Um, you're looking at, at the story of automation and the history of consumption. And as someone who teaches about history of technology, uh, we look at automation a lot in the history of work. And so I'm a, you could probably tell a parallel story um, where it's about designing subjects and in some cases the technologies in the workplace like the ones you're looking at in consumption increase mindfulness. I'm, I'm guessing you, there are technologies that help executives have more control and more choice and uh, extend their ability to do that. And then you, the more famous story in the history of technology are devices that uh, increase mindlessness like you're describing here with consumption but for workers, right? And so I just, my comment is that I see your project really focused on the consumption story in everyday life. Um, but I wonder if you also could reflect on parallels you see with these kinds of devices in the workplace um, that are also designing subjects um, for mindfulness and for mindlessness. Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, I would definitely say that um, the, the, the ethos of the, these technologies um, is that of the managerial um, labor and so very frequently you will hear you know be a ceo of yourself be a manager of yourself um, and a manager of course even in factory labor contexts um, yes must be very attuned and aware and keeping track of everything sort of like the sense mother right but also needs to delegate that to um, metrics and devices and you know even time and motion studies could be considered part of that um, th th those dispositif of, of um, the man managers um, but what this technology if you and that's certainly evident in this sort of compass logic right that you are your own CEO you are keeping track of your own um, you know quarter you're, you're generating your own quarterly reports and interestingly in the quantified self, Many of these people in quantified self were executives and managers and engineers, right? So they, they carried themselves and operated in, in this way anyway. And the financialization aspect, um, you know, with, with, with notes of managerial labor was so present in their own self-tracking that they would often talk about like quarterly reports on themselves. Um, so it was heavily financialized and heavily like managerial. But I think part of the story I'm telling is how that did not work so well when it was taken to market, you know, through these early quantrepreneurs who went to Quantified Self and tried to bring it to places like the Consumer Electronics Show, et cetera. And so every year when I went back, this was a, a methodology that I decided would work well because every year at the, at the Consumer Electronics Show, um, you've got like a year's worth of data and quarterly reports showing how this logic of design is performing. And partly as a result of how consumers responded and just an evolution in their own thinking, they realized, oh, you know, oh shit, people don't wanna be managers. People don't want to be CEOs of themselves. And so almost without consciously intending it, um, there was a retreat or a rowing back from that kind of CEO managerial logic um, toward um, something that looks a lot more like, um, let's not burden you, Let, let's de-quantify, let's not put yourself up front and center. So I always think of this example in my first book where casino managers realized 
you know, in all of their managerial attention, right, as the CEOs, they realized um, that they, it was not a good idea to ever have a right angle in a carpet because their casino going subjects, if they arrived at a right angle, would be put in the physical position of making a choice. And that physical position would put them in the cognitive mental state of being a choice making critical thinking subject where they had to decide, do I go left into the gaming area or do I go right toward the exit or go have a lunch, right? And it was critical to remove the critical thinking <laughs> capacities of the casino going subjects. So the, the, and to have them not keep track of what was being done to them, but to subtly guide them there. So in a very weird way, you could use that analogy and say that the initial quantified self formula of the compass was lots of right angles in your day where you were constantly being called to attention at decision points. Even every bite became a decision, right? Um, and gradually that, that was seen, this is a bad idea. This is not what people want. This is not a good formula to make money with. People aren't gonna use it. And it ultimately became far more of a smoothly curving, frictionless pathway, to use this example of the carpet, in which um, people were just subtly guided to destinations without being aware of all of this burdensome labor of decision points. So hopefully that, that goes some way toward answering your question. Thank you. Uh, there's another another hand. I I will also before the before David. I will um, I also want to to make a question. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, advertising of these uh, self tracking devices, and I since your work is uh, full of uh, ethnographic uh, detail, richness, uh, and many years of, uh, of work, at least the addiction by design. Um, what is your, I mean, what have what has been your ethnographic work about actual users of these uh, kind of uh, devices or if what is your approach uh, in this sense or, or the insights uh, about this? And then another question would be, uh, because it, it's, very, it's really interesting how uh, your focus, for example, on uh, casino and slot machines um, illuminates uh, the, the dynamics of addiction that uh, are not circumscribed in those casinos, but uh, we all have in our uh, smartphones to, to some level. Of course, it's a different, I mean, that illuminates the dynamics of uh, attention and, and, and interaction with the technology uh, regarding addiction in capitalism more globally. And uh, what I mean, how these uh, cybernetic ways of governance uh, through micro nudges, uh, notifications, etc., are uh, increasingly being uh, uh, shaping the the day-to-day -day smartphone more mundane, not quantified self uh, life of people. Right. So, just on the first part of your question, um, so. Um, I, I usually say uh, in, in this, this kind of talk that um, in order to sort of follow this, this piece of it and trace this design logic, I do focus um, just for a matter of time on the design side, right? So that I can um, sort of make that case. Um, and I don't talk about the users. And I don't think that it's necessary to talk about them when you can actually bracket the users. But of course, being, um, the scholar who I am and my own sensibilities, and you can see it in the addiction by design work. Um, I need in my own work to be able to triangulate across the use and design. Um, it's It wouldn't be as interesting to me if I was only talking about these sort of promissory visions and the way things play out in the design labs or at the consumer electronics show. So all along, um, I have also been doing research with the users, so not just the quantified self people, but um, actual users. It it's in many ways harder um, than pr it proved harder than my slot machine research 
because I can't go to Gamblers Anonymous meetings to find people to talk to or casinos or like live in a big city where everyone is doing this thing. Um, but one method was to go physically to like Best Buy or, you know, these big electronics stores and you can walk and sort of hang out for a long time in the aisles and you see people who are also hanging out in the aisles of the self-tracking technology, for instance, and they'll be in that kind of consumer reverie where they're looking at a product in their own little world and you know that they are um, sort of imagining themselves using this. What would I use this for? Would this solve my, you know, my dehydration or my, my trouble focusing on writing my dissertation or whatever? And so I would sort of approach these people um, without, you know, interrupting their reverie and ask them if they were thinking about buying something, explain my research and really try to solicit. They hadn't yet used it, but that was an, it was a really important entry point for me, just like the, the sort of imaginary of the designers. What was the imaginary use? Um, what, what were the desires and the longings? And then sometimes I would follow up with people after they had used it. And um, to see if the if the device had met or exceeded or more often um, you know failed uh, the, the the desires and the longings for what it was supposed to do, I also found that um, the the chat uh, the um, comments sections on like Amazon or other purchasing sites, people would get really passionate about this stuff, and I think it's because they had invested so much in this idea that in the in the sort of attention grabbing swirl of everyday contemporary life where they're contending with as you say you know facebook and social media and games on their phone and all manner of little micro nudges that something would help them to navigate that right if not as a compass but pre preferably as a sort of sentinel or a sense mother or in this algorithmic care um, and because that's such a personal and intimate longing, I think that accounted for the sometimes passionate responses where like, I returned this and I, I hate it and it didn't do it at all. Um, or people who actually found, um, found benefit from these things. So just, you know, you're asking more than just that in your, in your question. Um, there is, I'd say, I, I think as a scholar, it's it's been important for me in this project um, to insist upon holding open the difference um, in this array of technology that we're all living, um, you know, through and among and with. Um, and I, by that, I mean, instead of turning contemporary digital technology into a monolith, and in that model, social media micro nudges are the same as the Fitbit micro nudges or the happy fork, right? And you can just condense all this stuff into one big monolith and um, sort of rail against it. I, I think that that shuts down. There is, there is so much to rail against and it's super valid. And there's so many interesting scholars out there working on, on themes of you know, nefarious data extraction and surveillance and monetization. I myself, in my first book, it was all about monetizing attention and manipulating and exploiting and extracting both data and money from people, right? But what I was looking for in my second project and what I insist on holding open as a question is technology that is sort of fighting back. And I'm not saying that it succeeds, but I think it's very important to notice that two products, even two self-tracking products sitting next to each other on a shelf, a virtual shelf or a bricks and mortar shelf, um, may, be, may carry quite different models of the subject, might be addressing quite, addressing and calling into being quite different consumer capitalist subjects, right? And a little bit of what I was doing in my, in my talk and what I will do at greater length in the book is to try to discern, you know, like I, I am, I'm le leaving myself open to difference and trying through empirical and ethnographic work to figure out what's really going on in the way people are using this or the way people are designing this. 
um, and to discern and identify um, the, these moments of, of difference, which I find to be um, essential to even my outlook. Otherwise, I get really depressed if I'm just, you know, all of this stuff is bad. Um, I just recently wrote a paper on three different attention um, guidance technologies. Um, they're all different sort of brain interface, how to regulate your attention, how to intervene in your attention. And I really, um, my whole point is to mark out the very different designs of these three objects. And I take solace in the fact that um, one of them, I think, provides a, a way forward that is far more ethical, that allows more human flourishing. I don't see this technology going away anytime soon. So I would rather look really carefully at it and the ways that we're using it and sort of pick up on um, what is working in a way that we might want to go with, you know, in the future and what isn't. I think that this can really add pointed precision to our criticism when we do that rather than the sort of monolith approach. Thank you. Um, now we have uh, David Sparrett. Uh, th thank you very much. Sorry, I'm a bit murky, but I'm sitting here in the middle of a power outage. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, Addicted by Design, uh, but I'm also mindful of the way you've just answered the preceding question. So, so what I'm wondering a bit is whether you've seen any, any kind of sorting or difference or gradient in these self-monitoring feedback technologies that's related to different business models people might have because because at, at one end there's there's I don't, I don't even know if they're real examples there's the sell someone the device and that's the end of it and and then down at the other end you get to something closer like a kind of facebook model where there there isn't a device and you're closer to a kind of casino relationship where it's it's the the time or the engagement of the user that's being monetized i suppose the, the, the part of why i hesitated asking it is the, the obvious answer is no because everybody's in a relationship model now but but maybe some of them aren't and i was curious about that yes i did i did notice that um that there there, there is this gradient there are there are devices where you sort of buy it and it's like a, a one and done and then you own this thing and you can use it but the makers of it are not profiting from um your they don't care whether you use it every day or not right that's more that's sort of like the car um then there's a subscription model so back in the early days of the internet um it, and there's a really interesting uh addiction story to tell here as well um video gaming sites or mul multiplayer um game sites if it was run on a subscription model, you paid your money at the beginning of the month and the, the was not going to get any more, you know, if you played more or less. Um, sorry. Um, so they actually wanted to preserve their bandwidth and they were invested in kicking you off and getting you to go read a book instead of staying on their site. They already got your money. Um, bandwidth was at a premium and we've seen this with casinos too if you sort of sign up for going a certain number of days of the week to the casino right then the casino is more of a partner in getting you to leave at a certain stage and then we've got what i outlined in my book in the bricks and mortar casino example um but now we see rife and rampant online um, I didn't use this language when I was writing the book. In the book, I called it time on device. That's the time on device profit model that I think you had in mind asking this question, um, where every little click or second on the machine is how you make profit. You make profit from volume, not price. And this is now the click, um, the, the, the sort of click economy. 
um, of you know att attention, eyeballs, economy, whatever it rests in you spending time. And the idea there, the subject at stake there is not a subject who pays their subscription and then you try to get them to go or read a book or do something different because you already have their money. This subject is a subject you want them to sit and click and spend as much time on device as possible. So yes, there are different gradients in business models. And um, thank you for bringing that into this, this question of um, difference, right? And discerning which might be um, more um, ethical or accommodating to human flourishing than others. Just in terms of policy, that's a really interesting question. So, Owen? Hello. Thank you, Natasha, for that, for that talk. It was really great. Um, my question is in sort of two parts, really. Um, the first part is um, uh, the political economy of intentionality in the devices. Because it occurred to me that so many of these devices what they're trying to do is uh, use the word nudge. And since about 2008, economics, the kind of very vogueish economics has been called what's nudge, has been called nudge theory. The idea that you can replace forms of group building and decision making by um, uh, trying to influence behavior, but not at the level of communication. So I was wondering, in terms of the design of those devices, um, if you find any links between those, I mean, the, you know, the 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 prominent kind of advocates of nudge theory and the designers of those things. Um, the second one is about uh, use and uh, and and class related to the first point, which is the of the advertising. I mean, it's a very sort of um, aspirational middle class sort of subject that you know that's 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 being promoted there. So if you find any uses of these devices by um, more coercive institutions, for example, in prisons, um, in schools, uh, as a way to correct and um, track for negative reasons. No, um, yeah, so basically linking the two things to a, lib to a liberal or libertarian paternalism, really. Yeah, so um, starting with the last part of your question, absolutely, and in, in, um, in the book version, that will be far more front front and center and definitely in my entry point will be make, make observing that um, this technology often exact prototypes or exact like you'll go to a website of the, the the manufacturers of the different motors and pieces and you'll see that they're sending them to be used in like prison ankles um, bracelets to track prisoners um, or prisoners at large they will be sent, um, you know, the, the, the attention headsets that I was looking at can be purchased and worn if you are this sort of aspirational CEO type subject, um, but they're also being implemented in schools in China. Um, but instead of telling the students whether their attention is flagging or waning or waxing, um, it gets projected out toward the teacher. So only the teacher can see in this kind of headlight way whether their students are paying attention and their teacher is the one who gets all of the, um, the data. So it operates much more in that setup as a kind of panopticon for regulating um, behavior or discipline, you could say. And the same is for settings, institutional settings like factories, right? Workers and even, um, you know, Amazon itself, which sells a lot of this technology, has all sorts of ways of regulating its own workers and how many orders they're filling. Um, or even at the computer, even the, the computer workers at Amazon are sort of tracked in their productivity, et cetera. So yes, this technology lends itself to many implementations um, and many setups. So then going back to the, the first part of your question, I think you said the political economy of intentionality, your, your um, the voice broke out, but. Um, yeah, it, it was you know, just about the intentionality and it's linked with, I mean, explicit economic theory, I guess. Yeah, so um, I do think that um, this tracks, this technology, tracks along very well in its design and conception. Sometimes 
in a um, the, the designers are aware of this and sometimes they're not but they've probably just absorbed it in the culture um, of that is rife especially from where you're coming from in my country of nudge theory right and um, so-called libertarian paternalism which tries to get out of the um, sort of um, top-down bottom-up kind of predicament I mean libertarian paternalism was the the nudge theorists tongue-in-cheek um, way of um, saying that you know you you are being paternalist paternalistic in this libertarian way right it's sort of a contradiction in terms and you could say that all of these trackers who are inviting these micro nudges um, that they are being CEO, CEOs of themselves in a way they are retaining um, they are retaining the seat of, of a choice making agent sort of homo economicus subject um, but they are just delegating a lot of the the work of shoring up that subject um, to technology so that they can also be like carefree and absorbed etc so it's like the best of both of both worlds um, in, a, in an article that some people on this call may have read in um, what was it in it was in um, bio society journal in 2016 there's a there's an article where i um, actually engage with the nudge theory and the idea of the kind of micro nudges that these um, technologies implement but what i see in it though is a you know nudge theory is associated with neoliberal economics and what i see in the story that i'm telling is both an exemplification of that and as i've tried to to make this argument also a chipping away at it from the inside of this um, sort of cruelly op it, it sort of lays bare the cruel optimism of the self-responsible self-managing subject by showing these deep longings <laughs> needs whatever you want to call them not to have to manage all this stuff and contend with so much so many choices and so much self-regulation so it's kind of a story of the discontents of the neoliberal subject that reveals something a little different going on because at a certain point when you are delegating all of the choice making and the decision making and the tracking um, you are no longer really ceo right um, okay David Sparrett. Uh, sorry, it took me a moment to un unmute there. So, so I, I want to push a bit on on that point because I, I mean, yes, it feels like people don't want to be CEOs in the sense of managing the dashboard, but it but it felt to me a bit like the the fantasy is was it being uh rich people with with quite solicitous servants right who would sort of politely cough when you were eating too fast or or or, or something like that but it was still kind of assisting in a in a project and uh so so i, I wonder if you've run into examples or attempts that would be kind of genuinely rebellious in the sense of uh, uh, prostheses or something like that that were aimed at getting people to in some sense opt out of efficiency as a goal uh, e even if temporarily at the margins but a more substantial rejection of that ideal rather than just something that could one way or another be packaged as just managing the workflow of being efficient right of getting my work-life balance right and then being kind of maximally hedonistic in the off hours right because the, the easiest to point to doesn't quite work for for your question the easiest to point to are the stress management or like the meditation booths inside of companies or putting in pool tables or even sleep, even the focus on sleep, because all of that 
is ultimately um, in the, or you could say that it is ultimately in the service of being more productive, et cetera. And then there, it's like the gaping maws and we, we can't get out of it. And everything does seem then to collapse into this monolith where it's all in the, in the service of, uh, of this economy, right? Um, and you, you could say that. Um, I could also point to other examples, though. Um, they're, they are more artistic. They're sort of mindful, satirical, artistic ways that people come up with um, to, to the sort of anti-efficiency or things like um, realizing that you can put your fit if your insurance is being lowered because you've agreed to wear a Fitbit um, and you're like a, a, a Uber driver. I'm kind of mix, mixing different examples here. You would put the Fitbit on the, the tires of your car and that counts as steps or somebody designed a sort of metronome that sits on their desk so they can take a nap while the metronome does their steps they attach their fitbit to the metronome so there's a, all of these sorts of um fun fun examples out there but none that are i mean i think for obvious reasons none that are taken to market and show up at the consumer electronics show as something viable to sort of scale <laughs> and mm. and monetize um, but to, to what you were saying, you know, about the, the, the sort of butler, the sentinel butler logic here, um, I agree that from a certain perspective, that does look like a, a very cushy sort of CEO who, who is able to delegate things to many people. And yet there's still a sort of affect of efficiency, I think, um, in, in the kind of managerial uh, em embodiment that, um, yes, you may have a ton of people that you are delegating to cover certain things, but ultimately you're not just playing golf or napping. You are still deeply invested in this mission and in your role as CEO, and you are keeping track of them. There's still like a lot of keeping track that you are doing. And what I'm talking about, um, it, is is I mean that's happening. Even the sense mother is directed toward the actual mother, right? Who has to keep track of dad's pills and her kids' toothbrushing. Um, so she's putting one thing. She she is like the manager of her household, and she's tracking her kids. How how often did they brush their teeth and this and that? Um, so you could say that this is all sort of upholding this our tenuous grip on um, being subjects who are able to meet the aspiration to stay in the game. These are not slot machine addicts, right? Slot machine addicts want to be, they, they really are anti-efficiency in a way, right? This is just, they want to be out of time, out of space. They don't even want to be a self. What's interesting to me about this technology is that people really do want to stay in the world. They're looking to technology to help them stay in the game, to help them be a self. Um, what I am pointing to are the kind of, the, you, you could even say often, almost on the sort of affect psycho psychological level, what comes across when I speak to people about using this is this deep desire um, to let go off even in the way that slot machine addicts do and to not keep track at all and hoping that to some degree the this technology will let them do that because it will be taking track keeping track of it for them so there's a deep ambivalence here and maybe that's why i'm not giving a yes or no answer to that part of your question but it's that ambivalence that to me points to many of the fissures and cracks in the in the very kind of mode of being that these um, technologies would purport to uphold Okay, no, thank you. I understand you much better now. <laughs> that really helped. Uh, well, I think that uh, it's uh, almost uh, eight here. There it's uh, uh, almost two, perhaps. Um, it is, uh, I think that it's time to, to bring the, the, the seminar to a close. Um, well, many thanks, Natasha, for this great talk. And uh, many thanks uh, everyone for the for the discussion. We hope to read the the book soon, and yes, uh, to I'm be able to. I'm, I'm on sabbatical in the spring and hope to be uh, so s send good energy for completing my book.
Okay, <laughs> so a lot of good vibes is sent uh, through the screen to so that we are all able to to read the book uh, more extensively. Uh, it's also nice that we overcame the technological problems uh, without the need of using uh, these uh, cybernetic micro nudges so far. And uh, well, uh, lastly, only to uh, to invite everyone to the next uh, seminar of the Technology and Capitalism series, uh, which will be in December 16th. It's gonna be Daniel Carr, who is uh, gonna talk uh, about neural data and value production in biocapitalism, asking whether, uh, well, this is uh, labor or not. It's gonna be also uh, very interesting. Thanks everyone, thanks Natasha, and uh, see you in December. Yeah, thanks everyone, bye-bye. Thank you very much for the seminar. Ciao, ciao.